Well, hello everyone. I welcome you. Thank you for watching today as we look into God's Word and find another lesson of truth for us today. I extend my warm welcome to you all. If the FBC children are watching, it's good to, to have you here again as we continue our study in God's Word through these weeks. If you are watching at some other time here and are not normally with us here at Fellowship Bible Church, I welcome you. Thank you for listening in today and watching as we look into God's Word and find truth for us to live by as we go through our lives. Now, as you know, if you've been watching, we've been walking our way through the book of Daniel and learning from Daniel's character and his conduct, as well as learning about God's character through this time in this era of history. If you want to watch those videos, you can go back on our playlist and you can find more stories about the book of Daniel that we've recorded for you. But today we are continuing on in our study of God's Word, and we are moving from the book of Daniel to the book of Esther, where we're going to learn about God's sovereignty over all situations that we find ourselves in, and particularly the situation that Esther found herself in in this story. So, open your Bible to God's, in God's Word to the book of Esther. Find your own copy. As I read God's Word, I want you to have your own copy of God's Word in front of you so that you know that everything I'm saying is actually God's Word. They're not just my words that I'm saying, but it's from God's Word. So go grab your Bible and come back and sit down as we begin our study today. Have you ever played the game Yahtzee? Perhaps you have and you understand the, all the rules to this game and how it, how it works. Maybe you haven't, but let me explain how Yahtzee is, is played. Now in the game of Yahtzee, you have this cup here, perhaps, and then you have these die in here, usually five, and what you do is you shake them up and then you roll them out on a table and you're trying to get a sequence of different numbers. Maybe you're trying to get all threes uh, on your dice or maybe all fives or maybe a combination of different numbers and then you have your little sheet and each time you, each time you accomplish that set that you're trying to get, whether it's five fives or three threes or two of one number and three of another, whatever it may be, each time you accomplish that, you get to mark that off, and it's worth so many points. And so uh, the, the goal of the game is to fill in all of your different sets that you need to get and to, and to get the most points. And the way you do that is by accomplishing those sets. But you see, with Yahtzee, it's all up to chance. Because there's nothing that you can really do on your own to predict or to accomplish uh, whatever set you're trying to get. If you're trying to get all fives, it's not like you can even put them in a certain order in the cup and then roll them out and know for sure that you're going to get the numbers you're looking for. It's all up to chance. You know, there's a lot of things in life that we say are up to chance. And uh, we kind of just use that term, well, we'll see by chance what happens. Uh, but, like the, but the game of Yahtzee is exactly that. It's all chance. I can't predict what I'm going to get. I can hope for something. But it's all up to chance. When I roll those die out, uh, they're going to fall on the numbers. They're going to fall on. I can't help that. I can't change it at all. Now, you may feel like a lot of things in your life are just up to chance. Meaning, uh, you can only hope how they're going to turn out, but you really can't know for sure. And uh, those, things that those things like that in our lives can make us very, very fearful or very scared or nervous because we like to have control over everything, don't we? We like to know exactly how things are going to turn out. When I play Yahtzee, I want to know that it's going to turn out how I want it to turn out and I want to know I'm going to roll the right thing, but I can't ever know that. So every time I roll, I'm kind of nervous. Am I going to get the right numbers or not? Well, there are things in our lives that make us just as nervous or scared because they're reality. Are you ever nervous or scared that perhaps your parents are going to lose their job? You know, we're going through a time right now when there are a lot of what we call uncertainties. And we could say things are up to chance. You don't know if your parent is going to have a job one day or the next day. Maybe your dad comes home and he says he doesn't have a job anymore. And now you're worried and scared. How are we going to get the food that we need and how are we going to be, uh, be provided for? Or perhaps sometimes when your sibling gets very sick and that makes you nervous and scared because you don't know when or how they're going to get better. Or maybe 
It's when you have to move to a, nice, a new school and you're nervous about that. All those changes. How is it going to work out? I, I, can't, I don't have control over this situation. And that makes you very scared. Or perhaps it's just that you're moving up to a new grade. Maybe you're moving out of elementary school into middle school. And that makes you nervous. There's so many changes, different teachers, different friends, new friends. And there's more expectations or responsibilities for you during the school day. Whatever it may be, those things can make you fearful. But that change or that uncertainty or chance of how things are going to turn out. Perhaps uh, you are nervous or scared when times like these, when you're told by the government that you must stay home or that you're supposed to stay home and your parents uh, don't let you go out and play with your friends in your backyard or go over to their house and all of these changes make you very nervous and scared about the future or how things are going to turn out. Maybe you're afraid because your parent works in the medical field, they're a doctor or a nurse and during these times every day that they go to work you know there's a chance that they could get, this, get sick, maybe ca catch this disease that's going around. And those kind of things just make you very fearful. You don't want to see your parent get sick and uh, perhaps uh, even worse. And so, you, and so you are afraid of these things. All those feelings that go through your mind, you're scared, you're nervous, uh, you're, you're helpless. There's nothing you can do in your control to change the situation and all these feelings of helplessness and fear and nervousness make you feel very alone and very very fearful and afraid well we are going to learn today from the book of Esther and from Esther's life and her character and more specifically the character of God that we don't have to have those feelings of fear or being alone, or nervous, or just leaving everything up to chance, we can know that we serve a sovereign God. We're going to talk about what that means and how that can help calm our fears and our nervousness from a day on a day-to-day -day basis. Unlike chance, or the game of Yahtzee, which is all up to chance, our life and the life of all everyone on earth uh, is not up to just chance. Because there is a creator, a God, who is control, in control over all of these things, over all people and all circumstances. Now in our story today in the book of Esther, we're going to learn that Esther becomes queen of Persia. But let's look at a little bit of the background to this story to help us understand where we're talking about as far as the location and who the king is at the time and who Esther is and where she came from, and all of these kind of details that, if not talked about, can be uh, misunderstood or confusing as we talk about the life of Esther and what's happening in our story today. Now, when King Darius conquered Babylon, his kingdom of Persia became the largest kingdom in the world. Wow, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? And after King Darius, Ahasuerus took the throne. Can you say that word? King Ahasuerus, yeah, it's kind of an unfamiliar name, right? Imagine being named Ahasuerus. Now, the Jews that had been captured back when Daniel was a teenager now lived under the Persian king, King Ahasuerus. So remember back to when Daniel was taken to Babylon, and we were talking about the life of Daniel in Babylon and all the things that he went through under King Nebuchadnezzar, and then King Darius. Well, now there's a new king. Uh, in this land, and his name is King Ahasuerus. Esther was a beautiful young Jewish woman and had been chosen by King Ahasuerus to be the Queen of Persia. King Ahasuerus didn't know Esther was a Jew when he made her queen, but her cousin Mordecai, Esther's cousin Mordecai, had told her not to reveal it to the king, and so that's why the king didn't know about this. The, uh, Mordecai, Esther's cousin, told her to keep this, this, uh, I, this identity concealed and not tell the king about her background. Because Esther's parents were both dead, 
her cousin Mordecai had raised her as his own daughter. Mordecai was probably a little bit older than Esther, more like a father to her. And Mordecai loved Esther, and she obeyed his instructions, and Esther kept her Jewish heritage, that is, her background, her, her ethnicity, as a secret from King Ahasuerus. Now, the king had a royal advisor, and his name was Haman. Can you say Haman? That's right. The king had a, an advisor or a counselor or second guy, second in command kind of man, and his name was Haman. And Haman was a very proud and selfish man. He thought all about himself, and it was all about his title and his prominence in the kingdom. He enjoyed people bowing down to him because it made him feel very important in the land. And Haman passed through the streets, and as he did so, the people would bow down to Haman. Everyone, that is, except for Mordecai. You see, Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman for the same reason that Daniel's three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who we talked about a few weeks ago, refused to bow down to the statue of King Nebuchadnezzar. And why is that? Because they understood that to bow down to someone was like worshiping someone. There are times in scriptures where certain men would bow down to an angel, and even the angels refused to receive that kind of worship because they understood and knew that only God deserves our worship. And so Mordecai refused to bow down to Haman because this would be kind of a kind or type of worship that only God deserves. Mordecai was a Jew, one of God's people, and he worshiped the Lord God, and he knew that God had said not to bow down before anyone or anything but God. Look at Esther chapter 3, verse 5 in your Bible as I read from my Bible. It says in verse 5, When Haman saw that Mordecai did not bow down or pay homage to him, meaning worship him, Haman was filled with wrath. What is wrath? Wrath is anger. So Haman was very, very angry when Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him and respect him in the way that Haman wanted him to. That wretched Mordecai, Haman fumed when he recognized that Mordecai wouldn't bow down to him. Haman wasn't angry with Mordecai for not bowing. He was utterly furious. He refuses to bow down, Haman fumed. Who does he think he is? Doesn't he know who I am? I am the king's trusted advisor. I must figure out a way to get rid of rebellious Mordecai. Haman was so furious at Mordecai, and he was such a proud and arrogant man that he was willing to do something horrible to Mordecai because he was so angry at him for not bowing down to him. But now Haman had to come up with a reason or a way to get rid of Mordecai. And, Morde and Haman was even willing to have Mordecai be put to death just because he wouldn't bow down to him. Crafty Haman thought and thought to himself, how can I get rid of Mordecai? He thought, I'll show him. I will not only get rid of him, but I will also get rid of all the Jews. They should know better than to disrespect me. You see, Haman was using his position to threaten the Jews, the life of the Jews. And he was so furious that he was willing to not only get rid of Mordecai, but also to get rid of all of the Jews that lived in the land. Haman went to the king with his plan. And in Esther chapter 3, verses 8 and 9, this is what Haman said to King Ahasuerus. He said, There is a certain people scattered and dispersed among the people in all the provinces of your kingdom. Their laws are different from all other peoples, and they do not keep the king's laws. Therefore, it is not fitting for the king to let them remain. Now, who is Haman talking about here? Who are these people that have different laws? Well, that's God's chosen people, the people of Israel, who Mordecai was an uh, a individual of. He was one of God's chosen people because he was a Jewish man. He was an Israelite. And so was Esther. And, Mordecai, and Haman was so furious at Mordecai that he, was, he told the king, King Ahasuerus, that we should put these people to death. We should not allow them to remain in the land 
because they have different laws, different laws than other people, and they obey their God's laws instead of perhaps the king's laws. So, uh, Haman says in verse number 9, If it pleases the king, let a decree be written that they be destroyed, and I will pay 10,000 talents of silver into the hands of those who do the work to bring it into the king's treasuries. Haman was so angry and so furious and so set on putting the Jews to death that he was willing to go to very great means of providing uh, tr the king's treasury with more money just to see the Jews be put to death. King Ahasuerus trusted Haman because he was the king's advisor, and he agreed to this horrible, horrible plan. Oh no, he did not know, though, that his own beautiful Queen Esther was a Jew herself. Remember we said that the queen kept this a secret? The law was signed and it was sent throughout the entire kingdom. And when the Jews heard about this new law, they began to cry and to weep in the streets. Chapter 4, verse 1 and 2 of Esther says, When Mordecai learned all that had happened regarding this law, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gate, for no one might enter the king's gate clothed with sackcloth. Now, what, what did Mordecai do here? It says he tore his clothes and put sackcloth and ashes on his head. Now, we don't do this kind of thing today. You don't see people going around and tearing their clothes and putting ashes on their head. That was a kind of uh, thing that people did back then, though. And it signified mourning and grief. When someone was so grieved about something, perhaps someone passing away or finding out about something that caused them to be sad, they would put ashes upon their head and they would tear their clothes. And this was a sign to others that they were grieving and that they were very remorseful about something. And so this is what Mordecai did when he learned about this, this law that was going to put, put, be put into place, how all Jews were to be wiped out. Esther had not even heard about the law yet, though. She had no idea all of this was happening. But one day, her royal servants told her that Mordecai was sitting by the gate and weeping. Esther knew that there must have been something very wrong if Mordecai was doing this, and so she sent a messenger to find out what exactly was wrong. Tell Queen Esther about the law, said Mordecai to Esther's servants. Then tell her she must go to the king and beg him to save the lives of her people. When Esther received this message from Mordecai, she was horrified at what she heard. Who would do such a terrible thing, she thought. She didn't know what to do. Esther was in a very difficult situation. How would she deal with this? What could she do to fix this? Esther said to her servants, Explain to Mordecai that the king has not called me for 30 days. You see, Esther was the queen there, the queen of King Ahasuerus, but she couldn't just go up to the king whenever she wanted and talk to him. It's not maybe like, we, like a husband and wife today who can just communicate whenever they want, and of course they can talk to each other whenever they want, and they have that kind of relationship. But the relationship here between the king and the queen was a little bit different. And the king had to request that someone come before him, before someone could just show up at the king's throne and begin to speak to him. So Esther explained, You don't understand, I can't just go to the king whenever I please. There is a rule that says whoever goes before the king without being called or summoned to him, they will be put to death unless the king shows mercy and holds out his golden scepter to him. So Esther explained to Mordecai that the only way that she could go before the king and survive would be if he would extend this golden scepter, which kind of re resembled mercy, and if he extended it to her, then this would mean that he would hear her plea or what she had to say and not put her to death for coming earlier than he expected her to. 
So the messenger hurried back to Mordecai and told her all that Queen Esther had said. Look with me at Esther chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. And it says, And Mordecai told them to answer Esther, after he heard this message, and say to her, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. What is all of this talking about? What is Mordecai saying here? Well, Mordecai was telling Esther that if she didn't say anything to the king and if she didn't, if she didn't uh, make an attempt to stop this law from coming into place and from the Jews being wiped out, that she shouldn't think that even her own life would be spared just because she was the king or the queen to the king Ahasuerus. Sure, she was in a very important position and a high status, but she was a Jew. And it was likely that even she would be put to death if this wasn't stopped. And so Mordecai pleaded to Esther to go before the king because perhaps the Lord had put her in this position for such a time as this to stop the king from allowing this to go into place. Well, Esther thought and she replied, All right, I will go. I will tell, but tell all the Jews to fast for three days. My servants and I will do the same. Then I will go to the king. And even though it is against the law to go before him at this time, I will do it. And if I die, I die, Esther said. Esther pleaded to Mordecai to have all the Jews to, to fast and probably pray to the Lord during this time, and ask for his mercy upon Esther to save her from death so that the king would hear her plea. But Esther understood, you know what, it was worth going, and if she were to die, it was worth it, because Esther wanted to plead for her people's lives, the Jews' lives. Does this remind you of the character Daniel that we just talked about? who was willing to go to all ends to serve the Lord and to, to stand up for the Lord's uh, commands to pray and to worship the Lord alone, Esther was willing to do the same for her people so that her people, God's people, could survive through this time. Well, we learn that next that Esther gives a very interesting invitation to the king. You see, for three days and three nights, Esther and all the Jews went, out, went without food. That's what fasting means. It means to give up something. And oftentimes it's food. And so for three days, they devoted themselves to praying to the Lord, earnestly praying to the Lord to save them and to be merciful to Esther when she approached the king. And at the end of the third day, Esther bathed and dressed herself in the most beautiful royal robes she went to the king and into his throne room. What would he do when he saw her there? He had not asked her to come. She was breaking the law. In Esther chapter 5, verse 2, this is what happened. This is what it says. Now, so it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight. This means that the king was delighted to see her, and he wasn't angry because she broke the law and came before she was requested to. And the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand, that Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter. Wow. You see, the king was willing to listen to Esther, and he wasn't angry, and he held out that scepter, which signified mercy, that he was willing to hear her and not have her put to death. Whew! King Ahasuerus must have loved Queen Esther very much, and she was safe from being put to death. Yes, my queen, what is it that you wish? King Ahasuerus asked. 
I will give you anything you want, even up to half my kingdom. You would think that Esther would have fallen to her knees right then and there and begged the king to show mercy to her people. But that is not what she did. Instead, Queen Esther invited King Ahasuerus and Haman to a fancy royal banquet. How strange. What could Esther possibly have in mind? Why didn't she just ask, ask him there and then for him to revoke that law and to save the people? Nonetheless, the king was delighted and so agreed to come to her banquet. Haman was very pleased with himself, too. Well, 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 how about that? He was invited to the queen's banquet as well. I will dine with the king and queen of Persia. Truly, I am the favorite, thought Haman. I will have power and fame. Haman was very arrogant, as we said, and probably thought highly of himself when he was invited to this special banquet hosted by the queen Esther. And during the banquet, Esther did not tell the king what was troubling her. Instead, she invited King Ahasuerus and Haman to another banquet. So, here it was. By this time, Haman was so sure of himself that he thought he could ask the king for anything he wanted. You see, he was in such a prominent place, and now he had been invited twice to a banquet from, by, the king, by the queen and in the presence of King Ahasuerus, that he thought to himself, if I ask anything of, that I want at this time, I'm sure King Ahasuerus will grant it to me. So he went ahead and had gallows built for Mordecai. He had planned to hang Mordecai on these gallows and put him to death. You see, while the queen was conforming in a plan to save the people of Israel, the Jews, Haman was planning a very different wicked scheme to have Mordecai be put to death by hanging. Well, we learn that Haman's plan backfires on him in our next portion of the story. That night after the banquet and right before the, new, the next banquet that uh, Esther was going to host, King Ahasuerus could not sleep. He tossed and turned on his bed. And finally, he called for his servant to read to him from the record book. Usually, the royal records were very boring and enough to put someone to sleep. Have you ever asked maybe your mom or dad to read you a book before you go to bed? And there are certain books that you love for them to read and other ones that are just so boring and you never want them to read it? Well, in this case, the king wanted uh, them, this, his servants to read him this book of records that had to do with all the king's events and all of the things that had happened through the years, different stories and how the king handled them and whatever, all these kind of boring records. Perhaps King Ahasuerus thought these would put him to sleep. But while his servants were reading this record book to, to the king, the servant read a very interesting story about the time Mordecai, yes, the Mordecai we're talking about, had saved the king's life by telling the king about an evil plot that Mordecai had overheard. Wait, 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 King Ahasuerus interrupted his servant. What was done for this brave and honorable subject of mine? Nothing, your majesty, responded the servant. Tomorrow I will reward that man, then, the king answered, before drifting off back asleep. Early the next morning, Haman went to the palace. He planned to ask permission to hang Mordecai that very day. Good morning, your majesty, greeted Haman. Just the man I want to see, said King Ahasuerus. Tell me, what should I do for a man I wish to honor very greatly? Can you imagine Haman could hardly contain himself? The king must want to honor me thought Haman. Of course, that's not who the king had in mind. He had in mind Mordecai, who he had just learned about the night before, had done a very noble deed for him, and had never been honored for it. And so the king was asking Haman what he should do to honor Mordecai. Wow, what a backfire to what Haman was thinking. That's a great idea, agreed the king, when Haman 
described what should be done for the man who should be honored. Look with me at verses 7 through 9 of Esther chapter 6. This is what Haman said should be done to this man who is to be honored. He said, For the man whom the king delights to honor, let a royal robe be brought, which the king has worn, and a horse on which the king has ridden, which has a royal crest placed on his head. Then let this robe and this horse be delivered to the hand of the one of one of the king's most noble princes, that he may array the man whom the king delights to honor. Then parade him on a horseback through the city square, and proclaim before him, Thus shall, be, thus shall it be done to the man whom the king delights to honor. So Haman describes this wonderful event that should take place to whom the king wants to honor. How this royal robe, which is one of the king's robes, should be placed on him. And how one of the king's uh, horses should be given it to the hand of one of the king's princes. And how this honored man should be placed on the, on the horse. And should be taken and led through the city. And be shown to all the people how honored this man is. To be displayed in a parade-like fashion. Uh, how honored this man is. Well, the king thought this was a wonderful idea. Let's go get all these things for my loyal subject, Mordecai, said King Ahasuerus. Can you imagine Haman's face when he heard that King Ahasuerus was thinking of Mordecai and not himself? He must have been completely shocked and then very angry. He was planning to put Mordecai to death, and now King Ahasuerus wanted to honor King or honor Mordecai. But he had to obey the king's the king's orders. And so later that day Haman and King Ahasuerus went to the Queen's Esther's second second banquet. The king knew his queen must want something very important. He was so pleased with Esther he thought she was the best and most beautiful queen in all of the land. What is it you desire, my queen? he asked. Ask, and I will give you anything you wish, even up to half my kingdom. So you see, Haman and King Ahasuerus are now at the second banquet. They had already led Mordecai through the streets and praised and honored him, as King Ahasuerus had planned. And now they were at this banquet, the second banquet. King, Queen Esther had still not asked her request to the king to save the people of Israel. But would she now in the second banquet? Well, listen closely and let's see what happens. Esther took a big, deep breath. This was the most important thing she had ever waited for. In Esther chapter 7, verse 3, it says, Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given. Let my life be given me at my petition, and my people at my request. What was Queen Esther asking? What? roared the king. Who would dare to do this evil thing? Where is he? You see, Queen Esther had revealed to the king what was actually happening how this man wanted all of the Jews to be put to death. Esther pointed her finger. It is wicked Haman, the queen declared. The king was enraged. How dare this scoundrel plot against him and his beautiful queen. Soon after the banquet, a servant told King Ahasuerus about the gallows Haman had built for Mordecai. And in Esther chapter 7, verse 9 and 10, look what happened. It says here in verse 9, Now Harbana, which was one of the eunuchs, one of the king's servants, said to the king, Look, the gallows, fifty cubits wide, high, which Haman made for Mordecai, who spoke, the good, who spoke good on the king's behalf, is standing at the house of Haman. Then the king said, to, said Hang him on it. So they hanged Haman on the gallows that had been prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath was subsided. And so the very gallows that Haman had built to hang Mordecai on were the place of his own, Haman's own death. 
Wow, lots of changes. Haman's plan was backfired, and the king learned about this evil plot to have the people of Israel be put to death. And in a day's time, all of this changed. King Ahasuerus made Mordecai his new most trusted advisor. Then the king made a new law stating that the Jews could defend themselves and fight against anyone who tried to do them harm. To this day, the Jews celebrate the Feast of Purim, which is the feast that the, honors the Queen Esther and how she bravely rescued her people. You know, Esther was just an ordinary Jewish woman. Sure, she was the queen, but God in his sovereignty raised Esther up to become the queen of Persia. You see, all of this was in God's hands. Even the queen's own position as queen was all the result of, God, result of God's sovereignty and his control over all things. And God, in his sovereign control, gave Esther the courage to do to go to the king and beg for the life of her people. She must have been terrified. What if the king had, had not been happy when, she fa when he found out she had been hiding the fact that she was a Jew who worshipped God? What if the king had not held out his scepter and saved her life? What if the king had taken wicked Haman's side, but Esther trusted God's perfect control? She knew he had a bigger purpose, and she knew that it was God who sets up and takes down kings. She knew she was simply a part of God's big plan. Esther reveals a wonderful, wonderful characteristic about God in this story. That all things are in God's control. Esther didn't know if her life might be taken, or if the life of all her people, the people of Israel, may be taken, or if Mordecai would have, life's, Mordecai's life may have been taken. Things could have gone very, very differently. But Esther recognized, and we can recognize as well, that all things are in God's perfect control. All things are according to His sovereign plan. God being sovereign means He's in control of everything, every circumstance, everything that happens. He's in control of who's the next president, of who's the next king, of uh, what event's going to happen next, uh, where you're going to live next, uh, which, uh, which new school you might have to go to. Anything that you go through, God is in perfect control over because He is sovereign. So, we don't have to fear and we don't have to worry that everything is up to chance. That nothing can be controlled. Because they are being controlled by God. We can't control them. Just like our game Yahtzee, I can't control which numbers and dice I roll, or what numbers on my dice will end up being. But I don't have to worry about bigger situations like the things that Esther went through and the things that I go through in my life. Or the things that you go through in your life. Because none of those circumstances are just up to chance. If a sibling gets sick, or if one of your parents loses their jobs, or if you have to move to a new school, or when it's time to move up into middle school or a new grade, those things aren't just by chance. Those are by God's sovereign hand, by His control. And He's in perfect control over every circumstance that will come out of those situations. We shouldn't fear, but we should have faith in God. Faith that He is doing His perfect will. Our memory verse is from Proverbs chapter 21, verse 1. Let me read that for you now. And it says, The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord. He turns it wherever he wishes. Wow. God is in control of the most and greatest circumstances, like who becomes the next king or who becomes the next president. Sure, we make decisions in our life, but ultimately God is in control of all of these things. And knowing this should give us a sense of peace and rest. Not fear and helplessness, but perfect rest in God's control. Esther's bravery and faith in God are evidence to trust 
Her life is a lesson in God's sovereignty over all his children. God designs every aspect of life to position people and governments and situations for his plan and purpose. And that includes you, your life, your situations, the changes that you go through, the places where you live. All of these things are according to God's perfect plan. Nothing, nothing will go awry to God. Everything that happens are according to his perfect plan. And because of that, we need to trust God. Even in difficult situations, these are all according to God's perfect plan.